Well, we're very excited to be joined today by uh, Claude Silver. How are you doing today, Claude? I'm awesome. Really, really good. And great to see you in the uh, Great White North. Uh, yes, we are. Have you just out of curiosity, now that you mentioned it, have you been to Toronto before? Do you come here often? Or It sounds like a pickup line. <laughs> so hang on not he's, now he's well hang on though hang <laughs> on because now i'm curious is was it a good pickup line i got i got two beautiful ladies in front of me i I'm, know I'm actually i know uh, it worked it worked and um i'll carry on the conversation God, you're too easy too easy. i know, I know. you know it's thursday i'm feeling good um i have been to your city a number of times and i love it it is so like international and cosmopolitan and it's great food scene from what i recall we kind of consider ourselves manhattan's little yeah tiny baby brother yeah well <laughs> we're, we're in the real estate business here claude uh, the, the podcast is for our real estate purchasers investors and sellers but a lot of our listeners because our passion myself and laura's passion is entrepreneurship business and 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 documenting kind of the 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 journey and so but when we talk about real estate we always mention and compare almost everything to manhattan and 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 as laura mentioned we we definitely um call ourselves little manhattan because our, we're also built built on of a a little bit of a real estate island here we got the lake to the south of us and then we have this legislation on the north of us that makes all these condos appear so it definitely feels like manhattan we're starting to feel like it's it starting at least, to feel like it i gotta tell you this is like a history in the making for us because Jazz told me about you, Claude, a couple of years ago yeah. now when you became the CHO of Vayner Media. And as soon as I heard this title, I was like, tell me more. What is this? I'm so intrigued. Well, first you said, what do you, no, no, you mean, like, what's a CHO? Yeah. And I thought I was like, <laughs> Ugh, do I not ask? Is this like asking what a CFO is? Like, <laughs> right, does right. everyone know what this is? Yeah. And then I, I did a bit more of a deep dive on what it is that you're doing there and, and how this, this role came about. And I was like, well, I want to be a CHO when I'm older, right. <laughs> when it. I'm grown up, I want to be a CHO. Please. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about what a chief heart officer is? What do you do at VaynerMedia? Yes, of course. First and foremost, anyone can be a CHO. And I'm sure there are many, many CHOs out there already. Uh, the title is amazing and it's great. And you know, if you, if you love people and you want to make things better for people in the workplace and you have a heart to listen to people and connect them to one thing or the other, like you already are a CHO. So what do I do all day? I've, I've, I've been in this role for five years, so it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, I mean, I, I do what my personality dictates and what I think Gary's personality dictates because we, we created this role to scale him originally. And uh, when I asked him, you know, how do we know if I'm successful? He said, you will touch every single employee and infuse the agency with empathy. So that's my job description. That continues to be the only job description I have. How I go about doing that is based again on my personality and based on really intuition in terms of what I think someone needs in front of me when they come on the screen or when we're in the office. And I, my role is to literally take care of all the heartbeats in the companies, to take care of all the humans. And of course, I can't do all of that on a daily basis. So I've got a great team. I've got these culture champions that have day jobs, but they like, they understand us. They have our, you know, they have our DNA. They really get us. Uh, I, I trust them to really represent empathy and represent heart represent like you know what is it like to actually listen so i count on those people too and so my job is really to like i said it's 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 to hold space for people to understand what's up what makes them tick what do they need more of where do they want to go you know any single time let's it's literally someone pops on the screen and i'm like how can i provide you value how can i make your day better well, I love that question. How can I provide you value? It's a question that uh, uh, you ask hundreds here, of times a day, uh, probably <laughs> yeah. about a hundred times a day. Yeah. Um, and so, Great question. yeah, right. Because it, it, it definitely different for every person, it, it's different for every person. And now you can start to, if you really care at the person who asked that question, you can start to reverse engineer it. Right. And one of our mantras here is, is not only are we going to meet expectations, it's all about exceeding expectations. The only way to exceed expectations, if you know what somebody's expectations are, you then can exceed them. 
The question I had for you, Claude, is, and I have so many, but this this first question is, were you part of Vayner before you became CHO? Like, how did that whole, like, the, like yeah. I've never seen a posting for CHO before, right? <laughs> no, so no, yeah, how, I, would, how, I wouldn't know to apply. <laughs> yeah, right. So how did that all come about? Because yeah, I'm yeah. sure people are wondering that. I know we created the role. Yeah, I had been there. I was there for 16 months before okay. uh, I actually resigned. And then I came back when Gary and I sat down at breakfast and he said, that's it, you're coming back, you're gonna be the chief art officer. And as soon as he said the words chief art officer, I was like, oh yeah, of course, of course, that's my title. Like that's the title I've always had. What, what, what were you doing before? Sorry, Claude. I was SVP of client okay. service. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so I met Gary when I was living in London I was running digital strategy at a, a large uh, advertising agency. And um, you know, we met, we fell for each other. It was, it was pretty awesome. And I knew I just wanted to work with him. And I had a feeling that he wanted to work with me. We just really liked each other. And so I moved to New York and I started there. I was his first senior hire. So not only like a female leader, but first senior hire. And I had been, I came with experience from the advertising agency in the world already. You know, he's not from the agency world, which is I think one of his incredible strengths is he sees things in a different way. So, um, so yeah, I ran the Unilever team, which was a, a really, you know, large, like $10 million uh, account. I had a team of like 40 people. It was amazing. I had like my little, my own little agency. And um, one day it just, you know, the voice in my head just got so loud, which just said like, I don't want to do advertising anymore. I had done it for almost two, two decades. And I just, it didn't matter to me anymore. Like, don't get me wrong. I love the creative part, and I love coming up with you know ideas to uh, to build out on. But I just was it wasn't inspiring to me. And no longer, said, at least, right? It was no longer inspiring. And he said, "You know, what do you want to do?" It's his like famous line. And I said, <laughs> um, "I only care about people. I only care about the heartbeat of this place." And you know, eventually, we created this role and. You know, the role was really created to scale him, to really scale the unscalable in many ways and, and to, like, like you said, you know, infuse empathy, make sure I'm touching every single person and, you know, really removing any kind of fear from the system. And, and when you say fear, you mean, you mean the, 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 the guys and gals that work there in terms of like, I, I, you know, I don't want to do this job anymore, but I would love to be in the company, but I'm scared to talk to anybody about it. Cause if I go to Gary, he's going to, he's going to let me go. Or if I go to like just the HR, uh, uh, HR department, like when you say fear, like, what do yeah. you mean by that? Um, so first and foremost, we don't have an HR department. I renamed it the people and experience team. We have it. a people and experience. Cause that's just what it is. Right. And being that I had never done HR, it seemed super out of integrity to say I was running a department that I had any I, in any business being in. Um, no, removing fear is any kind of cynicism, is negativity, is um, is a lot of like crustiness. And we have such an open door policy, and he's such an accessible CEO, uh, and really understands and knows what's going on in the in the world, but certainly in Vayner that like any, oh, pretty much any problem is fixable. And so when there's negativity or cynicism, cynicism over there, it's like, guys, gals, just talk to us about it rather than gossiping over there and bullying people. That's what I talk about fear. That's like, no, no, there's no place for that. Just like there's no place for hate. There's no place for fear. And so my job is, is really, as I said earlier, like to hold space, to create safety for, for people. You know, psychological safety is a very big buzzword now, but it's real. It's really real. It's, you know, how can you create a place where someone feels like they can be themselves without judgment? And also understand that I don't have to have all the answers because I don't. I can certainly have suggestions and connect them to people that have answers. But I think that's one of the beautiful things when you can you know, put your ego in the back seat and just be like, okay, I get to ride as a passenger with this person, but I don't need to come up with all of the answers because I, I don't have all the answers of the world, you know? Yeah, we, um, we're we a small like team here compared to VaynerMedia. I'm sure you have thousands of employees. 1,300-ish now probably, Claude. What are you guys at? 
Yeah, it's about that a thousand globally. Okay. okay. Yeah. So obviously, given those numbers, it makes sense that you might need someone to to be more mindful of what's happening with the the feelings and the emotions the of culture. the staff, the culture that that lives there or works well lives there. <laughs> I always say I, I live at my office essentially. Um, do you advise like smaller teams? Like, should there be like we have fifty people on our team? Let's say. Do you advise that a team like that should have somebody in a position like yours? Or is it everyone's responsibility? Is it only the responsibility of the people at the top? What's kind of your thinking there? Or is it like once you get to 350 employees, then you need a CHO? Yeah. Uh, so I think every single company should acknowledge the people that want to lean in and make someone stay better. Like, again, title schmeidel, it doesn't really matter, right? So I think that's the first thing is, someone at the top should acknowledge, if you're not anointing someone, you wanna at least acknowledge that you've got these great culture champions or great, you know, people, people, and you know, you like them, you appreciate them. But I think, you know, culture does start at the top. Like Gary has dictated and said to us what this culture will be. It is all of our jobs side to side, bottom up, top down, whatever, to cultivate the culture every single day. And when I meet new hires on Mondays, and you know, when I meet new hires just who want to you know, chat with me, one of the things I say to them immediately is like, hey, you are as much a responsibility for this incredible culture as I am. Like, and isn't that cool? That means you actually matter. Now, now Claude, Tactically speaking, like, because we actually were at your office last time we were in Manhattan. 2018? 2019, I think maybe. 2019? Yeah, May 2019. <laughs> then we, 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 we saw you. You were like buzzing around. You're like a pinball in the whole office. I was like, and, there's Claude. And there's we were Claude. like, there's Claude. But you were busy. Like, we didn't want to interrupt you. And I know if we did, you would have been perfectly fine with it. But it just, I, I, we could tell how busy you were. Um, And we actually finished a podcast with Gary. And like, we stayed in that office afterwards for like three, four hours, hours or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Uh, Talking and, with Gary's like videographers and and team yeah. and, and it, it, it wasn't like set that we were there. Gary just and I think one of his admins at that time just said, "Yeah, guys, just hang out. We were gonna do a podcast with the Empathy Boys, Empathy Wines, which we did, but we just stuck around in your in your cafeteria there. And every single person, it was almost like we worked there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, Everyone's like, "Do you guys need anything? What's going?" On? I was like, "Oh, Isn't that awesome? some <laughs> amazing." It's Amazing. So awesome. Like people and, actually, you know, they really care about one another. It's such a friendly, collaborative culture. Like it's just, it, I don't know, it just hums. You know, I was in the office the other day on Friday, last Friday. Uh, we're not back yet, right? The office is open, but we're not officially back yet. And it was so nice just to walk in those those doors and just sit in the hallway. And there's something about that office space that we've created where there's a lot of alchemy like you just bring so many different unique people together which is what the culture is and everyone i feel and it's not a utopia of course but everyone i feel like can bring their little bit they can bring their like little ingredient for the minestrone soup their little ingredient and their little ingredient and we need everyone's ingredient you know when you were in the cafeteria that day what was happening was everyone's ingredient was represented. That's why you felt it. Now, definitely going to talk to you about how you guys have been able to and how you are navigating through the lockdown and not actually physically being together. Before I get there, though, um, where did it start from? I get the I get the fact that, Gary, that's what he wanted to do in culture, but the actual people that you bring on board, what's the process there? Is there two, three, 18 questions that are maybe asked in the hiring process? Or is it, you know what? I just kind of feel good about this Indian yeah. guy, Jazz. He's a good looking guy. He has some yeah, good pickup it's just lines. Sometimes gut feeling, right? And is it, is it gut feeling? Like what yeah. is it that you guys kind of go by yeah. for a lack of a better word? So we used to hire on gut feeling. We used okay. to hire for culture fit and culture fit alone. And then like, hey, you know, Jazz, let me teach you how to do Facebook ads. Like, let me, you know, and we, we did really well. We did that for five years or so. Um, we hired for culture fit and that got us a lot of, you know, similar people, uh, a lot of people that we wanted to ride on a Greyhound bus with a lot of people that like Pearl Jam, 
like the Jets. <laughs> <laughs> you're hiring people that you're like, oh yeah, you're like me. Um, when I took the role five years ago, it was really apparent that we had to shift from that. Like, oh yeah, you're like me because the, yeah, you're like me is very comfortable. Yes. And you're like me is going to mean that we're going to hire a lot of people that look like me. Yes. You know, or look like my brother. And that doesn't represent a, the world, the macrocosm that does not create any kind of uh, inclusive environment, diverse, inclusive environment. And really, I mean, we're an advertising agency. We need to make sure that we can market to our consumers who are in the world and they don't look like me, you know? So we, uh, we started saying skill set fit and culture addition. And the skill set fit means in certain um, uh, departments, you do have to either, you know, present a case study, take it take like a data test if you're on the media team, you know, know what you're doing number wise. Um, so you have to have the skills. And then of course you color outside of the lines, but right. the culture addition allows for people to think differently, you know, to bring in different kinds of inspiration or different kind of wonder, or, you know, like, I don't know, be from a completely different culture and completely different language and religion and, you know, bring that to us. So that's the world today, right? If, if we're not hiring for diversity, and if we're not hiring to create, you know, the, the, the microcosm that matches the macro world, like you might as well just shut down because that's just that those days are over long gone. So, it's so interesting, Clyde, we hire here a lot on, on fit and, and culture, like, would they fit with the culture? Not, you know, do they look like us or obviously we don't even look alike. So, <laughs> so that, that's one thing, but what do you do when, you know, I'm, I'm, a little confused at how you hire people to fit and how you want something to feel that might not necessarily agree with you. Like I'm sure you and Gary even sometimes don't agree on how the culture should be or how people will interact with each other. Doesn't that kind of get watered down as you diversify more and more? Or do you actually think it's the opposite? It, it builds better culture. Yeah, I definitely think it builds better culture. We don't want people that think exactly the same as us, you know, and that would just be, that just gives you a sea of sameness. And I think a sea of sameness in the environment in which we work and what we do is not good. That's kind of, that feels very status quo to me. It doesn't feel like we're being innovative in any way, shape or form. So how do you overcome sometimes like if there are disagreements and, or like there's probably, I'm sure at the size that you're at, like there's many groups you know it starts to feel like high school cl again right a little clicks, a little clicky right? like yeah. how do you guys deal with that you know there are going to be clicks because there are people that work in really tight teams so whether or not you know different different account teams maybe you're on the budweiser team maybe you're on the diageo team maybe you're on the um uh you know banking team whatever so of course you're gonna you, know, you stick with who you you're in the trenches with every single day um the click thing you know that's an interesting one because sure, I, I'm not naive. I'm sure that happens. I don't, I haven't heard about it recently. I have, mm -hmm. I did hear about it a few years ago, like a, you know, mean boys, mean girls club. And that <laughs> has to, um, we need to like blow that up. That I doesn't think. work. That's like, do you just get rid of those people or how do you go about you blowing that up? Yeah. I mean, you have conversations with people and you let people know like that's not going to work. I mean, you figure out where it's coming from. You figure out like where the seed, the actual seed is, you know, who's running that click, like who, there's who always people, somebody, <laughs> who are those people, you know, <laughs> yeah. and then, and then, you know, you try your best to remind them of like who we are. Now, of course, no one's going to be like, yes, I'm a mean girl. I'm a mean boy. So yeah, sometimes it ends up being like, this isn't the place. Like bullies are not going to survive here. And, and we stick to that. Like we really, people, putting the people first and really caring about people. I know people say a lot. I know companies say right, left and center. But the fact that we're so high touch, we're so accessible and available. And the fact that like, we actually really care when someone's family members in the hospital or your dog got sick or you got engaged or you had a baby or you want to pitch, like we just care. And you can see all of that care on our Slack channels, like while we're virtual, right? You can right. see all of that. And 
Yeah, I mean, do you know, do Gary and I disagree about the culture? I can't say we actually do as long as I'm sticking to what it is my job is. You know, my, my job has never been to like, the house is red, go paint it black. That's different, that's change management. I've been in cultures where I've done that. But this isn't change management necessarily. This yeah. is sh being the shepherd of something that's really precious. And we want it to be the greatest career choice of any single person that comes to Vayner. Well, I mean, you, you said so many words that resonate with us and it makes me feel so happy that we're on that similar track, um, high touch. I mean, that's another word that we speak about here often. We're always trying to keep our ears and eyes open mm -hmm. on if, if, if like my, my, my personal uh, assistant, my executive assistant that just joined us about three, four weeks ago um, at, in the interview process, she mentioned that she, she got a cat and us being in real estate, not even me. I like, I heard it, but I didn't think of it. It was Laura and Luke who thought of, Hey, like uh, uh, we could go online and get her a little cat condo. Yeah. So the, for her first day, she shows up to work and she gets a gift for her new cat. Kind like of thing, it's right? built like a condo or something. Like that, right? You mentioned that requires a lot of listening. I think that's where people might go wrong is because if you're not listening, you're never going to catch those little things that mean so much to people. Right. Right. And what you did was you created like an act of serendipity. You know, you gave her what we call surprise and delight. Like she will remember that forever. You absolutely like made that person's day because you listen and you care. You know, I always say like, it's one thing to listen. Like that's enormous part of the job. That's, that is like 90% of the job, but then taking action is where I think a lot of people may fall down. They just, they may be great listeners and that's terrific. But at the end of the day, I think, especially if you're a leader, people are coming to you to actually do something. And so that last 10% is like where the rubber hits the road, I think. And, and do you think that 10% sometimes is just like, it's laziness or, or like they've heard it and it's just like, oh, I can get to it later or it's not gonna make that big of, it's not gonna give me a big ROI. What do you, like, yeah, what? Yeah. Um, you know, people are busy. Yeah. People are busy and there's a lot of pressure to um, to perform and hit your numbers. And this is in every company. And so you know, we that we ask a lot of our leaders. We ask a, an enormous amount of our leaders to like, listen, sh just show up and walk, walk the talk. You know, and when I, I, because I listen a lot, you know, when I hear that, you know, a leader went halfway there, but not the whole way there. Yeah, of course I can understand and have compassion that that person's probably extremely busy running a team of 50 or 200 or whatever. But at the end of the day, like if you're a leader, like you're there, you're there to really show up and take action and do something, right? And I will say until my last breath, as a leader, like our job, I really believe is to help other people unlock so that they can become heroes. They can become their own champions. They can become the best, whatever they want to be. And that takes a lot of like checking yourself before you wreck yourself and checking your ego out the door. Like this is, I, I show up on screen and this isn't like about how Claude can be like the, you know, get more stripes on my arms. Like I'm good. I want to, I want to be of service. And that's like, I expect a lot from leaders. I really do. I, I find the irony in all of this is probably that the more that you truly care about your employees is probably reflective in the effectiveness of their work. Right. And so I'm sure you guys have found, even since you've probably been hired, that the ROI on you is probably pretty great. And, you know, it, it's, it's a job that people probably wouldn't think of. And they're always worried about the numbers you said, but it's like, if you just do this one thing, the numbers are probably going to take care of themselves in a lot of way. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, a thousand percent. When someone says to me, like, what's the ROI of heart? What's the ROI of your job? What's the ROI about caring to people? I'm like, uh, what's not the ROI? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're almost like not even wanting to have that battle with that person. Like, it's like, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> Every dollar that's made here is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you take care of your people and you really put your money where your mouth is and you are high touch and you really give a shit, 
Yeah. That I guarantee you, not only will that person stay there, they're probably going to refer two of their friends to you. So you get longevity and loyalty. You get word of mouth referrals. You don't have to pay for a, a, a recruiter. And uh, you probably get like less sick days and you probably get someone that really will lean in and, you know, then mentor and, you know, be there for the long haul. I mean, the, you know, retention, you want to keep your retention numbers very high. I, 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 I'm not sure if it's still the same there, but I think in one of Gary's vlogs, I heard him speak about um, how I think it was both YouTube, but maybe the whole team where at one point you guys had um, had it set that the employees can take as long as vacation as they wanted as to, many days but then I, as many days, but then I think you realize that nobody took you seriously. Maybe you could just walk, <laughs> they didn't walk us through it. it. Like, you'd think everyone's going to take like three months off. But yeah. That's probably yeah. not what happened. Right. I know. Yeah. We have unlimited vacation policy, which is great. And you know, there's parameters there. Like it's up to about 21 days. Right. Okay. Like, you know, taking any time. Then, I mean, it's not really, you're not really, I mean, if you take yeah. more than like three or four weeks off, it's like, it's very different. That's a different. You probably, well, yeah, you probably don't want to be there anyways. Like, there why? In right. essence, you know what, what you're saying yeah. is like, it's not like someone who starts tomorrow. It's like you get your 10 days of vacation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, you yeah. have to take every single one of them yeah. because they don't transfer to next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. What did I, I used to work at a company that was like use it or lose it. Yeah. And okay. I wasn't a vacation taker, you know, in, in back in the day. I mean, I'm still not a great vacation taker, but, but I do, I do now use it because I have a family, but. Um, yeah, I mean, the point is, is like, we want people to be able to take care of themselves and we want people to be able to take care of whatever it is they need to take care of. And so if you need, you know, uh, emotionally, emotional health day, mental health day, like, just let us know. All we ask is that you let us know by 8 a.m. That's it. If you don't know the night before, you don't know three days in advance, like you're going to be depressed and worn out and burnt yeah. out on Thursday. Like, that's cool. Yeah, let us people know. Yeah. <laughs> Let us know by eight. And, and, and you know, the last, the last year and change has been so disruptive and unsettling to everyone in the world. And certainly in America, it has not been easy times. Um, and we need to really make sure that we're, we're not only taking care of our people with the programs that we bring in, uh, but how we empower them to take care of themselves, you know? So March 14th, I think March 16th, I apologize. 2020 is when we heard the news that we're going into lockdown. Um, my listeners know and our listeners know that both myself and Laura thought this was going to be two weeks. So we told everyone we to take it. We obviously weren't paying to Claude, attention. Claude, we told everyone to take a two week <laughs> vacation two and weeks. paid. Don't worry, everyone. <laughs> Chill out. It's not going to last we're that long. We're still on the out of here. Flight <laughs> of the Bahamas, not. Yeah, not. Um, at that time, what the heck went through your head? Oh like, what are we going to do? Like, what was happening behind the scenes in Vayner? Yeah. Well, and obviously, like, your role specifically, because I'm not sure if at that time you were, like, fam like uh, your, your staff's families were, were passing away or if they got sick. Like, I don't know what the heck was going on. I would love to get into your head at that time period. And then, and then, and then, sorry, if you don't mind walking us through how you've been able to navigate, uh, navigate. Yeah, through it. Totally. Um, so <clears throat> a couple of people at work had been telling me like in February that this was coming, this was coming. And I'm such an optimist <laughs> that I was like, yeah, like, yeah. Like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. It's not going to hit us. It's not going to hit New York. No, just like, we got this. Yeah. Don't think about I'm, getting sick. Think positive. Don't think yeah. about getting sick. I, I'm, I'm like, all three of us are the same. <laughs> everything's going to work out, you know. Um, and then, and I was telling Gary, like, that sounds like this is coming. This is coming. We just stayed really close to it. And then as soon as it came into our building, as soon as people um, had COVID and they were in our building in, in New York, that's when we had to let everyone go home. And so that was March 11th. Prior to that, though, I had been sending out, you know, global uh, emails like we're paying attention, we're listening. If you're, if this is giving you anxiety already, please go home, take your computer, take your charger, that kind of stuff. Um, so really, kind of like trying to batten down the hatches, and then of course we went into triage mode, which everyone went into triage mode. 
yes, I thought it was going to be two or three weeks as well. But as soon as we found out that it wasn't going to be, it was like, okay, let's get everyone over the, across the world safe. Let's make sure that people have what they need at home. <clears throat> How can we support our parents, our working parents, uh, our with, with kids? You know, oh my God, daycare is closed. You don't have any uh, help at home. Like you're you're having to take care of your kid and getting on calls and the dog is barking and you need to get groceries, but you don't want anyone coming to your home and you don't want to go to the store. Like we had to just do all of that. And I really call it you know, a triage, like survival mode. It was like, mm -hmm. how can we help? Who can I, who can I touch while dealing with my own stuff? Right. Mm -hmm. So what we did as a company, starting with Gary, starting with me, starting with our COO, um, is we really started to over communicate. And I say over because before we weren't, we didn't have to communicate. We, there was no triage going on, right? So, you know, we did a lot of over communicating about like, you know, being at home, working from all that stuff, tools and tricks and how could we help? And did you need a, um, you know, did you need a standing desk? Did you need a screen, whatever, you know, all that stuff. Do you need 5G? Cause you've got, you live with four people and you know, four other roommates, right? stuff like that um and then right i would say right is like not that we were like adapting at all come late may but then you know the murder of george floyd happened and then another emotional upheaval you know really really tough on top of something that was already so upsetting for people which was like being at home and missing people and not you know how to, you know, how are you going to chick, cook chicken once again tonight? And then we have like, you know, some real heavy, heavy trauma uh, in the country. And this affected, you know, affected everyone all over the world. But that was very, very tough because, um, you know, there was a, there are a lot of emotions. And, and again, like there was not a lot of answers. I started holding what I call courageous conversations. Uh, so did a lot of that, brought all of our, um, our uh, CRGs, community resource groups together and, and really together with our Black community really leaned in on how we could help our communities at Vayner, but also like what could we do donation wise in the country? Like how did we want to support Black businesses, those types of things. So you know, I mean, it's, it, I can't say that like we've gotten, it, you know, there are certain things that have smoothed out mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, we, I think we finally did get to like some kind of sustain mode, you know, you get like survival, adapting, sustain, and then like, well, I think we know a little bit more about the virus as well, right? Like yeah. at home, we were washing grocery bags. We were That's cleaning right. the grocery. Like there was some, yeah. like really odd things that we were doing, but I don't think we're that scared. Not no. that it's no. not real, right? But yeah. Yeah, because then now we've all emerged stronger. You know, we're stronger, we're wiser. Yeah, and you, you do adapt, right? But yeah, you guys had a lot of heavy stuff. And then add on to that, the election, like and all the I mean, emotions around that. And we're just watching from up here. You know, we get very involved and in, obviously the world does and what happens in, in the U.S. And so, but like hearing it from your mouth, it's like, wow, yeah, I can only imagine, um, you know, having to deal with it from your angle. And I almost wonder for you, like, while you're busy, caring for all these people and responsible for their mental health and their well-being does it ever take a toll on you or are you re-energized by it claude also has a young baby how old is the baby now yeah, she's two and a half as of uh yesterday yeah, yeah like you got you got a lot going on well too. and a two and a half year old's you? easy don't worry so she can have like i i get it like <laughs> uh, like oh. to your point laura with all this going on and having a two and a half year old yeah. like so easy, not, <laughs> not fun, but not easy. Um, you know, there uh, there were definite days that I was so overwhelmed with holding a lot of emotion for people. There were definite moments where I was really burnt out and like, whoa, this is overwhelming for me too. Um, and to answer your question, I do get energized by being of service. I do get energized by showing up and and being here you know if i didn't then if i didn't then authentically i couldn't do this job because the job requires you to have all hands on deck that doesn't mean that i can't be crusty one day or i can't be burnt out or whatever but 
uh, and that doesn't, and it's, my personality isn't one to really get burnt out a lot, but there have been moments where I'm like, I am in bed at seven. Wow. And just out. How, who That's do like you me go, every like, day. <laughs> how do you deal with it personally? Is it? Yeah. I mean, I think I had to find different ways. I have to say to deal with it throughout this entire, you know, year and change. I mean, at first, I think I just was so busy with work and, you know, juggling the kid that it was like, that's all I did. That was yeah, like, you didn't even have time to reflect. Right. Yeah. And people were like, oh, let's have cocktails on Friday. It was like, are you kidding me? I am so exhausted <laughs> yeah. and still need to like get my daughter to eat, you know, and then bathe her. So it took me a while to actually like start to kind of like feel what Claude needs again, if that makes sense. And that was, you know, the great thing is that I have a real core posse of, of uh, girlfriends um, that are in different, you know, ones from, from childhood and ones from junior high and high school and ones from later on in life. And so, you know, I have that, those anchors. Um, I really leaned into cooking a lot, uh, which was a great creative outlet for me, working out and, um, watching a lot of like zoning out, I would say watching a lot of documentaries. And, and, and so Claude, is that something that you have been advising the people at Vayner, like the, the thousand plus people that you get into conversations with is find some outlets, try to go back to like the surround yourself with, even like though we tribe. can't do it physically with a lot of people, but that tribe that Laura just mentioned, is that kind of the advice that you're giving your thousand plus people now as well? Yeah, I, yes. And some of the advice is also like, take advantage of the life coaching that we give you. Like every single employee has access to life coaching. Take advantage of the meditation every, you know, every other day. Like take advantage of things that we have put in place because we know that, that people need to take care of themselves. You know, the life coaching, for example, is anonymous. Like you just show up and you talk about whatever you want. Is that, that with like you? Is that with you? Sorry, Claude. Is that with it, you guys have somebody else on staff? Or? Yeah, we, no, we use a we use a company that Got has a, okay. that has an online platform called Inner You, and it's phenomenal. And people show up; they get one on one coaching as well once a month. So you know, the advice I give is like, figure out what it is you need, and if you can't figure out what it is you need, that's okay. Just take a break, step away you know, step away from the computer. Someone told me the other day, they had a um, 20, 20, 20 rule. This wasn't someone at work, someone else. Um, every 20 minutes, they take a break. They take a 20 minute break and they step 20, at least 20 feet away from their laptop. Hmm. That was really interesting. It's like just giving that permission, right? To people. Cause a lot of people like, they might know they need a break but they don't feel they're allowed. They don't feel yeah. they can. Right? Yeah, well, that's, I, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Claude. Go ahead. No, you go. You go, Claude. The balance. I mean, the, we never, I don't think we ever had balance, but, you know, the balance has been shot. So it's like, how do you find synergies and how do you, you know, f- make sure that things are all flowing at least in the same direction? And so one of the things I've been saying lately is not work life balance, but it's really like life work balance because life is now what we have spent a lot of our time in life. We're at home you know, or, you know, dogs, bar, all that stuff. And how do we now integrate work into life, which is very backwards than what we've been trained to do. Yeah. I mean, to your point as well, Laura, I think like with you, even specifically, you've been on the, like with this table here in this room Mm -hmm. with me for the last six years. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, you've said it to me out loud. Like, it's just, look, I don't want to feel like I'm letting the team down. Yeah. And, and it's People like, put a lot of pressure on themselves, well, right? You, and you do it to yeah. yourself sometimes. And I'm like, Lord, but like, if you don't rest or you're not, if you're not good, we're not good. Right. Yeah. And so like, I, I'm sure you go through that a lot and you hear and see that a lot, Claude. People are actually like, they really want to do good. And, and, but you yeah. might see it. You might see the forest for the trees, so to speak. Right. Right. Yeah. From both. I see the trees from the, the trees <laughs> and the forest, the forest from the trees. Um, But, you know, I send a lot of Slack messages out and those Slack messages are are, are sometimes like, thank you. We appreciate you. We, we, you know, have a great weekend, you know, get out, you know, stop tune, uh, turn off your computer at one o'clock on Fridays. Like I send a lot of things out or like, you know, the other day, uh, the trial, the um, decision of the trial, the trial, um, George Floyd trial, like, 
you know, an hour before I was like, hey, everyone, this is a lot. Just totally cool if you want to shut down for the day. What does that do? Like, are you guys then like, oh, we didn't really mean everyone shut down. Like, we still need things to get sent. And like, because sometimes I'm sure you have deadlines and things, right? Yeah, is that like a company-wide message you're sending? I'm curious too. Yeah, that was an all company. That was a company-wide. Yeah, I mean, this stuff is real. Like, people are super impacted by what has gone on in our country. And so to to it's not deny that but to ignore that would be to ignore myself also right so yeah things get sent i mean it's you know we we are we are a real high functioning place so it's not like people are like peace out right? <laughs> i'll get to that later i'll see you on monday yeah yeah people are responsible they're responsible and they you know they're very appreciative of this time or you know when you know gary just took like two weeks off and that's awesome you know, I mean, people need to see that. So, you know, now that we're getting closer to maybe the, I, I don't even want to say the end of this thing because I keep saying that. And then it's like, <laughs> Laura, you and <laughs> I have happen. been wrong I'm since day too. one. I'm girl. like, it's over. It's going to be over. But let's pretend that we are getting near the end of this thing. Like we're in real estate and there's a lot of buzz here around people aren't going to want to come to the office and everyone now knows how to work from home and no one's going to want to be there. So, you know, office, like office buildings and and pricing has all gone down and people, 50,000 people have moved out of the city of Toronto. And I, I heard Ryan Serhant talk about the number that I now forget. Maybe it was 1.5 million. I think it was like 1.1, 1.2 million or something out out of Manhattan or something like that. And what are your thoughts on this? Like you obviously have your finger on the pulse with everyone at your company, are they like dying to get back? What's your thoughts? Um, I'd say it's probably like 30% are. And okay. that 30 is loud. They're like, they, they really want to be with people again. Um, and then I think there's a, a huge swath of people that are like, I'm cool two days a week in the office, you know, or I'm cool every, every second week I'll go in. And then there's of course people that are like, nope, I'm good working from home forever. So we have to figure out how to juggle that. We also, you know, we have five generations in our company, you know, so it's it's super multi-generational and that doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, all boomers want to stay at home. That's not the point, but there's, there's the point is there's people in different life stages. Life stages, yeah. You know, there's people that are just having babies right now. There's people that are just trying to get pregnant. There are people that are like, you know, they're 18 and they're deciding not to go to college and work for us like, so yeah, we have to take you have to take into account all of that. But yeah. are not, you concerned about the culture, like how that might impact, like if people aren't physically together, or like no, you're like we've yeah. figured out culture through Zoom, we're good. No. <laughs> no, it's definitely a concern. I mean, I think that you know we're gonna do we're gonna try to do that either everyone is in a, in the same room, so either you have a meeting and everyone on that team is in the office and in the same room, or everyone is on Zoom, so you're on the in the room or on Zoom. And that way, because people have gotten very attached to this type of behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Um, What we don't want to happen is like the three of us are on Zoom because we decided to work at home and the five, there's other five, the five other people on the team are in person and like, you know, you can't really see people's body language, you know, Mm -hmm. other stuff is going on and that's not going to feel good. So we're really going to try to do this, you know, everyone's on the, in the room or everyone's on Zoom. And ah, I like that. I yeah, like, and no, I can no see hybrid. people who wouldn't even bother to bring people on the Zoom. Like if you're a group of five and you're just chit chatting, and then you don't even think to bring in yeah people who it's, are it's, home that don't know this conversation's going on, right? Yeah, and it's easy to do. I mean, if, remember when we were in the office, you know, and you're all on like um, uh, uh, you know conference calls, and someone's like in the LA office, and it's hard. There's all this, you know, some some people mumble, and it's all this kind of like. You know, crosstalk and you don't get the essence of what's happening and, and we can't um you know penalize people for that so oh. yeah it's going to be interesting that's a, a real human development um study i think well claude i i think i was probably about 19 20 years old so this was about exa- almost 20 years ago that i heard um gentleman from verizon my, the name just eludes me right now. How could I even forget his name? Uh, Richard Branson. Yeah, I, I heard like... Richard Branson speak. And um, he said, if you take care of your staff, sorry, let me rephrase. He said, 
true. He he takes care of his staff more than he takes care of his employees because if I uh, takes care more uh, than his than his uh, customers because knowing that if he takes care of his staff, they'll take care of the clients. And I, I like that really rang really really true to me. And I was like, one day when when I need help, I'm just that's what I'm gonna do. And it is a definite dream of mine to have a CHO. I don't think I'm going to be able to take you away from <laughs> Gary anytime soon. Uh, no shot at you, Gary. Um, <laughs> but what would I like? What would I be looking for? Like, 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 how would I find a Claude myself? You know, I, I, I sometimes joke around here that Laura is kind of the chief of staff around here, yeah. but she has her own dreams and aspirations to possibly maybe run her own thing, or maybe she might be the person, right? Because she knows me. Yeah, very but it's well. funny that I always say, but I don't have like a background in psychology or sociology. Like, yeah. I don't know if those are skill sets that you need, or you tell us. Yeah, I mean, again, I think this goes back to who the company is and who who's in charge, you know, what the, what the ethos, what the vibe is of the company. And then you find someone who can really mirror that and also propel that, like push it forward. And like, I just happen to love people and I'm, I'm intrigued by human behavior. And that was like something I studied forever. And, you know, I was you know, a terrible student and I didn't have any options for myself. And thank God, like I felt, I found my way into this world of agency life. I have no idea. I had no business being in it. Everyone I talked to was like, oh yeah, I studied marketing and communications. Like I graduated college at 28. Like it's the last thing I was studying. I was like, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I don't know how I got into it, but I mean, I do, but so I think there has to be a marriage of like what, what the company is all about, what the CEO wants and who's that person. And like, remember, I didn't have HR in my background. I do now, you know, and when I took the job and Gary, you know, Gary said like the person that runs our HR, like I had to learn it. And I, I hired thankfully a really strong team and have the, those people around me who are playing to their strengths. This is my strength. I'm playing to my strength. So you find someone that, this is their strength and, and you'll know it, you know, you know it. Cause you'd be like, oh yeah, like that person's finishing my sentences or that person like, it all, again, it all depends. Like for me, Gary and I are optimists. Like we are unwavering optimists and that is aligned with our culture. And there's gonna be someone else that is gonna be, you know, slightly different in their personality, but I think figure out what, why you're hiring this person. So my job isn't just the culture. My job is the people and the experience. My job is operations. My job is gonna go solve a big issue right now in uh, the LA office in my next call. My job is, is, is figuring out like talent development and uh, recruiting pl plans and talent acquisition and making sure that we have a learning and development curriculum and it's everything. And, and that means I want to know what's going on. I want to know what, what's going on with our people so that we can give them everything and more so that they can be the best that they can possibly be and that they spend time making the intermediate the best that it can possibly be. Certain uh, level of curiosity is required, right? Being interested in people and the, and the people around. Sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm sure that you have just like, how, how good does it feel to have been part of that fabric and and now have seen people grow in the last five years? Like, I'm sure there's a lot of shifting around within Vayner as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, you know, I answered the question, like, how good is it to see people I've known forever wow. developing, you know, and Yes, at Vayner, of course, that's where I spend the majority of my time. And I'm so jazzed. I'm jazzed even when people leave because they found something else. They, you know, they found something where they feel like they can really flourish again for the next X amount of years. And, but I, you know, I just want every, I want us all, I want us all to feel like we can remove whatever shackles we shackle ourselves in and spread our wings. I want it for myself. I want it for you. I want it for everyone. 
Well, there's a sign right behind Laura. It's a little tough for, oh, for you yeah, to no, see, but the viewers that. have seen it before. <laughs> um, it says removing friction. We had someone, a local Toronto artist come and graffiti this sign that says Love removing it. friction. And to yeah. us, that means removing the friction from where you are to where you want to get to. And that's, it really serves as a reminder to all of us here in our office and in our company that uh, uh, do whatever it takes to help someone remove that friction and you embody that um when i heard i heard your name as we mentioned earlier uh very early in the process of learning about gary and and vayner media i was like i needed to have this conversation selfishly because i wanted to learn how i could how i could spread more of that positivity that i was given by my parents as well as a young kid right. and 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 i could just tell how much like how much of the fabric you are like part of the fabric that you are. So just like, thank you for everything that you do on a day to day basis. And thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. I know how crazy you are. You mentioned you're getting on a call uh, with, with, with the LA crew as well. I mean, Laura, yeah, I, no, I just want to say kudos to, to Vayner and Gary and you, because you've really trailblazed a, a new concept or, or at least a concept that should be in every single organization. We just got to, look at business and doing business differently. These are people's lives, right? This is where we spend the most of our time and we want it to be, everyone wants to be happy. Everyone wants to enjoy it and feel that they belong. And for some reason, just when you look back at history, we just could never figure that out. And I really feel like you guys are onto something that's so incredible. And I'm excited to see, you know, how this kind of translates across society over time. So kudos to you guys. Thank you so much. It's great to meet you both. Thanks for having me. Until Thank next you. time. And when you do come, when this all does get all opened up again, please come to Toronto. Not that you need people to take you around, but we would we would definitely want to take you out for whatever your advice is, water, coffee, or some Done. scotch. All right. Done. Take care. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Claude. Take, take care. care. Have a great week.